it's way too scary to travel as a single female person. I can totally travel with my pets. I heard you can totally take a 40 foot RV on the going to the sun road. Oh, my life is such a wreck. You know what would work really good? I'll just move into my vehicle. What do all these things have in common? They're myths about solo female travel. Let's debunk them together. Hello, my magpies. Welcome back to Magpie Girl and Frankie. I'm Magpie Girl and Frankie is my 92 Dodge Road Trek, a class B RV. Where's Frankie? I give you one guess. Frankie's in the shop again. But while we're dry docked, let's do something else. I've been spending more time while I haven't been traveling these last few weeks in Facebook groups that are dedicated to solo female camping style travel. Camping in cars, camping in vans, in tents, in RVs, you get the picture. And I've noticed that there are four or five myths that are floating around sort of in the ethos that I think makes it either harder for women to jump into this lifestyle or makes it more difficult the first few weeks or months they are living this lifestyle. So I'd like to go through them one by one and kind of debunk them and offer you some tips and tricks for dismantling them so that if you want to travel solo nomadically, you don't have to carry this sort of mental weight of these myths. Are you ready? Let's go. The number one myth that I feel like keeps popping up in these groups is that solo female travel is dangerous. People's loved ones tell them that, people carry that concern internally. And the first thing I want to say is that your emotions are valid. So many of us, myself included, have experienced violence against our persons because we are femme identifying, female identified women. Um, so it's not unreasonable to have that fear. But I think there are some things we can do to turn down the volume on that fear and make our experience better. So I'm gonna give you one thing to stop doing and one thing to start doing to debunk this mythology in your own mind. The first thing I suggest that you do is to stop listening to crime shows. I'm sorry, Ashley and Britt, love your podcast so much, but everyone that I'm talking to today, if you're carrying around fear about solo female travel, you need to go on a crime junkie diet. Okay, you don't have to give it up forever, but right now, if you're feeling anxious about traveling alone, when you lay down at night and it's dark and you're all by yourself and you've been eating a steady diet of criminal minds and crime junkies and alphabet murder books, it's going to come back up in your, in your psyche, in your imagination. So just for now, go on a diet of this kind of material. Once you have traveled a few nights on your own or a few weeks on your own and you're getting the hang of it, your confidence is rising, you can go back and check out and see what Ashley and Britt are up to on Crime Junkies, okay? But right now, Crime Junkie Diet. So that's one thing that you should stop doing is stop feeding yourself a steady diet of scary stories. The second thing you need to do is something you need to start doing. Start debunking the information. What are the stats on these things? How risky is it really to travel alone in a national campground, a state park, BLM land? It's less risky than you think. And that is because we as women culturally are fed a steady diet of scary shit, right? Like, especially if you're of a certain age, 50 or older, and you grew up in the 70s and 80s, you were fed a steady diet of after school specials showing you all the ways that you could die. You watched Nightline, you watched, you know, Murder in Aruba. You were fed all of this stuff your whole life. So you need to eat something else now. And what I'm suggesting is a steady diet of the podcast you're wrong about. Sarah and Michael are funny and smart and they're excellent researchers and they will debunk things that you are scared about. So the episodes I want to recommend of you're wrong about, you can find it on any podcast app. Please listen to the one about stranger danger. Please, please listen to the one about sex trafficking. The stats are super low on that. Please listen to the one about dare. This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. That's a fear mongering program that we all grew up on. And oh, there was one more. Oh yeah, it wouldn't hurt to listen to the episode about after school specials. If nothing else, it's really interesting. 
Okay, so to de debunk that first myth that it's too scary for you to travel solo, stop eating scary stories, start feeding your brain with some facts. The number two myth that I see coming up again and again that causes people problems when they first start this travel, and this would be for men and women, all genders in between, is the myth that I can totally travel with my pets. Ah, pets, they're adorable. You know what? He hates travel. He hates it. He doesn't like the turkeys. He doesn't like the dogs. He doesn't like to get his feet wet. He hates everything about travel. My other dog, she likes it just fine. However, I can't always travel with my pet, and here's why. If you are in a metal rig and it is hot outside, your rig will get hot faster than you anticipate. And a lot of trails, especially most trails in national parks, will not allow you to take your dog on the trail. Here's an example. My daughter and I went to Yosemite over Easter break. It was only 74 degrees outside. We took a short hike on the valley floor. I have a waggle pet monitor that pings my phone when the temperature in my van starts to get very close to 80 degrees, which is when it starts to become dangerous for pets. We were only on the valley floor in very mild weather for about an hour and a half when my monitor went off. It was almost 80 degrees in the van. The van was parked in the shade. The windows were open. The, th the fan was running. The reflectics were up. So that really helped me realize that I can't travel safely with my dogs in high temperature areas, not in my little van. I have heard that it's less serious if you have a bigger rig because they don't heat up as fast. So my rig is 19 feet long, nine, nine feet high. It's not a big rig. But if you have a big class C or a class A, maybe you can go longer, but you definitely want to monitor it. You want to be aware that you can't take your dogs on trails. And you have to think a little bit about like, how am I gonna get my groceries if it's really hot? If I'm living full time in the van and I have to be in one location for work, how hot or cold is that location going to get? Can I chase 70 and move around with the weather or is that too expensive gas wise? There's other things of course to consider too with your dogs like pet bills and pet food and vet bills and other things like that. But those feel more surmountable. The weather is a tricky one and you're gonna have to Think it through before you jump into full-time living or even take your dog on a long, hot trip in your vehicle because I don't want to see you have to rehome your pets. And I do see that happening in some of these groups and it's just heartbreaking. And oftentimes people are over a financial barrel and they don't have any choice. So think it through before you travel with your pets. You can do it depending on the pet and depending on the weather. The number three myth that I see floating around in the ethos that we need to debunk for each other is this idea that you can just jump into van life. Now, maybe you're a person who lives on chaos. I have a friend who does things like goes to tsunami zones and works on rescued efforts. And she told me once that her brain feels the clearest when she is in an area that is experiencing crisis. Her creativity is really high functioning. She feels calm and kind of like in the zone. And I'm baffled by that. So if you're a person who thrives on chaos, go ahead. Buy whatever rig you want, jump into it. You'll figure it out as you go along and you'll probably feel great. But if you're a person like me who has a core value of stability, who likes ritual, who needs routine, if you have a health issue that needs routine, also like me, fibromyalgia, you do have to do some planning before you jump into this lifestyle. It will make it so much more fun. And the planning is fun too. Now I have watched thousands of hours of van life and RV videos probably. And it's been fun and I've learned so much. But if you don't have time or the inclination to kind of wade through all the information that's out there, I have two fantastic female written resources for you. The first one is from Amber Baldwin at Story Chasers. Amber has a great free budgeting program on her website, okay? She's at storychasers.com or you can find her on YouTube, but in her shop, you can load, download her free products as well as her four pay classes. The budgeting course will help you break down all the things that I guarantee you there are things that you have not thought of, expenses you have not thought of before jumping into this lifestyle. She was an accountant, She's very thorough, she's very methodical, especially if you're gonna to try to go nomadic full-time, please use her program to think of all the things, repairs, insurance, mail services, 
what to do about your medical care. Like she will help you budget it all out. Um, the other excellent female produced program is from Barefoot Theory. This Barefoot Theory has a free course, multi-week, like you get a, 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 um, a module every week on how to become a full-time nomad. She'll tell you what to do about insurance, how to establish a mailing address, what if you want to vote, how do you establish residency. She has lists for like your minimalist wardrobe that you'll need and like how to downsize your stuff, how to work from your vehicle, what do you do about Wi-Fi. It's all in Barefoot Theory's free course. Go get it. Take some of the guesswork out of the way. It's going to be so much more fun if you learn a little before you go. And I have like a, a 3B, I guess. This is like a subset of that. If you're the myth, the myth here, it's a little bit hard to make it sound catchy, but the myth here is when my life is blowing up, that is an excellent time to move into my vehicle. Now I want to be clear, there are plenty of women who are living the nomadic lifestyle out of financial circumstances where they just had to move out of their sticks and bricks or because they're escaping domestic violence. This world is not easy for women and bad things happen. And if you fled straight out of your home into the cheapest van you could find or your vehicle or whatever, good for you. I am so, so proud of you. If you are a lady of privilege and something happens, you lose your job, you have a midlife crisis, there's a divorce, your house floods, you could leap right into your vehicle, but if you have any possibility at all to find something temporary and create a plan, I highly advise that you do so. If you are in an emotionally charged state, you do not need to move into a vehicle that literally has a thousand moving parts. There's looking for places to stay. There's figuring out your water source. How does your energy system work? What about dumping your tanks if you have them? How do you create a trip plan? There's a lot of things to learn in your first few weeks and months of nomadic living. And if you're also dealing with emotional upheaval, it's going to be hard to do. So get yourself to a little bit more of a stable place. Create a little bit of plan. L moving from your sticks and bricks into your vehicle is not going to solve all your problems. The final myth that I want to debunk, and don't get mad at me about this one, my friends, is that camping is the same thing as RVing. Camping and RVing are like a Venn diagram and they only overlap a little bit. <laughs> if you are camping out of your car, in a tent, in a small travel trailer, in a class B RV, that is more what I would define as camping. You're not carrying a lot of electronics, so you don't need to be hooked up all the time. You don't need a huge power source. You can live quietly. You don't have to run a generator. You can live more remotely. You don't have to be in a campground with hookups and services. It's a different uh, flavor of this lifestyle. I see a lot of women buying very large vehicles over, so a class B usually tops out at about 23 feet, 20 to 23 feet. But I see people buying 35, 40 foot vehicles and then towing a car behind it. And they want to experience that camping experience, but they can't get into all of the campgrounds, especially the smaller, more picturesque remote campgrounds. They need to be hooked up all the time because they're running a Vitamix and a crock pot and an Instapot and their hair dryer and they want to shower every day. And they have their pet gates and their cabanas and that is a style of travel. It is not really camping. It is RVing. And there's no judgment here around that. My parents are RVers. They love it. It's super fun. They stay in RV parks and then they tow their Jeep and they use the Jeep to travel like the little twisty turny scenic byways that their vehicles are too big for. And then they come back to the RV park at night. They have a campfire. It's lovely. But what I see in some of these solo female travel groups is women think they're going to be able to get up super windy roads, see beautiful vistas. Um, and it's really hard to do in a big RV. A big RV is like a movable cabin. It comes with its own set of challenges. A smaller, more nimble vehicle like a sprinter van, a road truck, a small pleasure way, an SUV with a tent that goes on top, something like that. 
you're going to have a lot more options. It's going to feel a lot more camping. Hopefully you're going to get a, be able to get away from the sound of generators. You're not going to have to be cook, hooked up all the time. Now, if you want creature comforts, if you want a full queen size bed, you want a shower every day, get an RV. That's awesome. But just be clear that camping and RVing are not always the same thing. So that's what I have for you today in my little mini study of what people are talking about in solo female travel groups. Um, we can debunk the myths. It is not too scary or dangerous to travel alone. You can travel with your pets if you have a plan. You can transition comfortably and carefully into van life and not cause yourself more anxiety. And you can choose between camping and RVing, depending on what your needs and interests are. So I hope that was interesting for you today. I'm sure a lot of people um, don't necessarily agree with my take on this, and that's fine to each their own. But I just wanted to share some observations and offer some tips for sort of debunking any myths that are floating around out there in the ethos so that you can have an amazing time traveling. If you would like to have more tips on any of these myths, maybe you want to learn more about being safe while traveling. Maybe you want to have more tips and tricks for traveling with your pets. Please let me know. I'm always looking from you to find out what information would be the most helpful for you. Until we meet again, I hope that you will get curious, trust your gut, and whatever you do, pick the path with the most promise.